Hello to everyone listening, and welcome to another episode of Nat Chat. I'm Nat Eliason, and as always, we are exploring what to do as a college student, recent graduate who feels like they don't fit in this system of degrees, grades, one-size-fits-all careers, and are looking for something more exciting. In this episode, I'm joined by Blake Bowles. Blake has been working on a number of projects since his second year of college when he stumbled upon a book that really opened his eyes to the world of unschooling, alternative education, and how students could be learning better outside the traditional systems. When he graduated, he worked for a camp that did weekly trips for students in California to go out and do some outdoor education. And when that ended, he ran off to South America for three months, decided he wanted to build a life around working with these students in alternative education programs, particularly unschooling, while also being able to travel. So he started something that's now called Unschool Adventures, where he takes these students on long trips, two-month trips to interesting places around the world. He started by going back to South America, where he had been. He's got an upcoming trip in Southeast Asia. And we had a lot of fun in this episode talking about alternative education styles, unschooling, how Blake got started in these projects, finding that motivation to leave the traditional system and do projects you're interested in, and just all of the areas that you know I'm interested in about how we can fix the existing systems. So whether you're a high school student who's trying to get out of the current system, a college student who wants to self-educate better, or somebody who's graduated and trying to figure out how you can take something you're interested in and turn it into a career, this is a great interview for you. So with no further ado, let's welcome Blake to the show. Blake, welcome. I'm catching you in Germany right now, right? You are correct. Yeah. And you've been basically traveling kind of like nonstop as far as I can tell. Right. So what brings you to Germany now? A woman. A woman. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's that's the one line answer right there. <laughs> but you're not primarily working from Germany, right? You sort of move all around with what you're doing. Yeah. So some of my work, I have to be somewhere. I take teenagers on international trips. And so I get to choose where I go. But then, you know, I have to be there. It's not remote work. And then in the rest of my year, I do writing and web publishing and other projects. And I can do that from anywhere. So I'm working right now from Germany. And you're going to Southeast Asia for the next one of those trips, right? Yeah, in just a week and a half, I'm taking a group of 11 unschooled teenagers to Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam for seven weeks. That trip looks amazing. Have you done that circuit before? No. Oh, cool. So it's going to be the first time for you, too. That's right. Nice. How do you figure out like what to do and where to go for these trips if you haven't been there before? Oftentimes, I've been there before. Like I've run a lot of trips to Argentina and New Zealand, and I've spent a lot of time there myself. But yeah, for a trip like this, and before I did a trip to Nepal, having never been there, and a trip to Australia, having never been there, uh, yeah, like it's important to do your research, right? Because you're bringing like <laughs> 10 young human beings, and then you are primarily responsible for their health and safety. And so for this trip, I did a lot of interviewing of other trip leaders who have taken like youth or gap year groups to the region, uh, friends who have been there on personal trips recently, a lot of just, you know, regular like Lonely Planet type research. And um, yeah, so that's it. And what are you taking them there for? What are these unschool adventures? Yeah, that's a question I get a lot. And usually it's framed in like, so what are they going to learn? Yeah, well, that was going to be a follow up, but feel free to (laughs) go ahead with that too. Well, you know, your podcast is already kind of on the level of questioning, you know, traditional educational norms. So yeah, we go for the same reason that the average maybe 23 year old might go backpacking after maybe they finish college or if they're just, you know, travel hungry for whatever reason. Uh, the same reason that an 18-year-old might go on a trip in between high school and college or whatever's coming next. It's for the sake of travel. It's for the experience of independent travel and getting somewhere and having, you know, not being overwhelmed, kind of having a basic game plan, but getting there and having a lot of freedom to explore within this rough itinerary that we've set out for the group. And so I offer this experience, which is usually something that, you know, 18 to 20-something-year-olds do to a slightly younger age group of 15, 16, 17-year-olds. And we do it within this group context. So they do have a set of trip leaders to make sure that everything's going to be just fine. But within our itineraries, they have a very long leash to go explore and go off in small groups on their own and to really kind of make the trip what they want it to be instead of just following the preset hour by hour itinerary, which I think is, is standard for most teen travel experiences. 
Yeah, I did a couple of those when I was in, I guess, high school. And it was just so incredibly regimented where you had basically no freedom to go off and do anything. And that almost became part of the game was trying to just like sneak off for an hour, right? Which, of course, you know, everybody lost their shit if you did. I remember going on a very brief school organized trip to London, I think after eighth grade. And the one thing like we did a bunch of historical stuff. And the only thing I remember was sneaking away with my best friend for 45 minutes to go try to buy uh, matches <laughs> <laughs> to kind of indulge our, you know, you know, adolescent pyromania. Nothing bad happened. We got to the airport. We were going to fly home. And, and my, we looked at the things that you can't bring matches on the plane. My friend started panicking and threw them all in the trash can in the, in the <laughs> London airport bathroom. It was hilarious. That's great. So why bring these kinds of trips to a younger crowd? And who are these kids? Because you're going during the school year, but you're taking them for almost two months. Yeah, my trips are open to ages 14 to 19. And that's flexible. And you don't have to have any, you know, sort of weird educational status. Like I've taken high school students before. But fundamentally, yes, it's very difficult to do this if you're in high school or in normal college because it's multiple months out of the school year. And I actively avoid planning trips during the summer because there's too much competition, honestly. There's too many other good programs that run during the summer, during winter or spring breaks. And great, you know, if you like one of those programs, go do it. I'm offering longer term stuff during the school year where there's virtually no one else offering similar programs. And mostly the kids who sign up for these trips are unschoolers. That's the label that they use. So that legally, that means they're a homeschooler. But practically, that means they're not just replicating school at home. They're not just taking whatever, you know, the 10th grade curriculum and, and doing it at home and in the loneliness of their bedrooms. But unschooling is more about self-directed learning, figuring out what you're interested in, going really deep into something. Um, self-directed learning, that's what I consider unschooling to be. How did your involvement with the unschooling group start? Because you, I mean, you were not unschooled growing up, right? No, I went to California public schools, had a fairly traditional suburban middle class upbringing. Um, had a few cool experiences outside of school during the summers. Like I went to a wilderness summer camp in Northern California and I got to live in Chile with a host family for a month when I was 14. And so I got a taste of, kind of these more experiential education type activities. But really what happened was in college, I went into college studying astronomy and physics with this idea of becoming a research scientist. And it was super interesting stuff. But I, I, I saw what the graduate students actually did and realized that it was kind of miserable. It wasn't going to be the right fit for me. So I was questioning the whole research science path. And I had this backup plan of becoming a high school science teacher, because I also knew that I liked working with young people, especially teenagers. And then I read a John Taylor Gatto book. He's this New York City award winning school teacher. He was New York State teacher of the year twice, New York City teacher of the year three times. And he did all this cool stuff, getting kids out of his middle school English classroom to go do cool stuff in the community and independent research projects and building stuff, just all the stuff that you would remember from a K through 12 education. And then after doing all this amazing stuff, he quit in 1991 and wrote an op-ed to the Wall Street Journal saying he no longer wanted to make a living hurting kids anymore. And then he started writing books and lecturing for most of the 90s and the early 2000s about why he thought the school system was broken and why he was a firm proponent of all sorts of alternative schools and alternative methods of education. So I just stumbled onto this book and I read it and I was completely like engulfed. I was intellectually captured by it. And very soon I was on Amazon buying all of the books that, you know, people who bought John Taylor Gatto also bought. So then I started reading about democratic free schools, about unschooling, about the Summerhill School in England. Just I was caught in the web. And very soon I decided that I needed to study this stuff full time. So I changed my major and I designed a major in alternative schooling. Um, and that's what I did for my second half of undergraduate. And so I still graduated with a bachelor's degree, but it's a self-designed bachelor's degree. And like as far down the totem pole of having viable job prospects as you can get. Like its official title is alternative schooling and science education, which essentially qualified me for my first job after college, which was working at Astro Camp. Ugh. Oh, well, to be fair, though, I feel like maybe the experiences at Astro Camp have been very useful now with doing all the unschooled ventures, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Maybe that didn't come off. I, I loved working at Astro Camp <laughs> for, for, for one season. I got to 
take kids hiking and take them on ropes courses and teach them basic physical sciences and kind of expound upon my love of astronomy. But it was a very you know, outdoor education, experiential education type place. But after a few years of working in outdoor education, I became fairly disillusioned because it's just one week. California is the best place to work in the outdoor education industry because it's state mandated that all fifth or sixth graders need to go and do a one week of outdoor education. So they travel away from the school to go essentially do summer camp for a week during the school year. And so that's fun for me and other, you know, other staff members there because it's like being a summer camp counselor year round. You can work the spring season, you can work the fall season, and then in the summer you go work at an actual summer camp. Just camp, camp, camp. Uh, but the turnover rate is very high. Like you get a group that comes in on Monday, you learn all their names, you build some rapport, you start being able to work with them, and then they leave on Friday. And that's not the kind of educator experience that I was looking for. I'm more interested in longer term, deeper you know, relationships with students, not just these really quick, perfunctory uh, weeks. Yeah, I, that makes a lot of sense. And what was the book, by the way? Because you mentioned the book. I don't think we got the title. Yeah. John Taylor Gatto's most famous book is Dumbing Us Down. But the book that I read is called A Different Kind of Teacher. And I still really love that book. And very few people have seen it because it's sort of out of print. But you can get it on Amazon. Okay, great. No, we'll, we'll be sure to link to all of that. So when you stopped doing the like outdoor education stuff, is that when you went straight into doing your own programs or was there an intermediate step in there? Yeah, there was an intermediate step where I ran away to South America for three months. <laughs> I feel like that is slowly becoming like a requirement for people in any kind of self-directed learning space. The number of friends that I have, and maybe it's just sort of selection bias, but I feel like so many people that I talk to who are doing their own thing now have at least some period where they ran off to Brazil or Argentina or Colombia. At least five or six people on this podcast so far have done that. That, shh, don't talk about the secret. I know. <laughs> don't let the cat out of the bolsa. <laughs> Yeah, well, then I'm just following the same path that everyone else did. And at age 24, after a couple of years of working in outdoor education, I said enough with this, but I didn't know what was next because, you know, I was bitten by this alternative education bug. So I had all these fairly radical ideas and I didn't want to go work in a regular school or substitute in a regular school. I thought about becoming a Montessori school teacher, but Montessori is so focused on younger years. There's not really much for high school aged kids. And so I just didn't know what to do. And so I said, well, there's one thing I know I like to do, and that's travel. And so I spent three months making my way from Ecuador down to Argentina, and I'd never been to any of these places. And when I got to Argentina, I really fell in love with the country. And I usually don't like big cities. I'm more of like a small mountain town type person. But Buenos Aires was, uh, you know, I had this Paris feeling, this European feeling. But you know, you've been there. It's it's something magical. It's not like any other place I've I've experienced. And also it helped that it was, you know, in the year 2007, it was still pretty affordable, still relatively close to the financial crisis years for them. And so good for a North American to be traveling there. And I walked away from that experience just thinking like, how can I get back to South America? You know, I don't have the money to do it. I spent my savings traveling and now I need to go back and work again. And something else had happened, which was I'd recently started working at a summer camp, another summer camp, in addition to this wilderness one um, that I've been associated with for a long time. This other camp was called Not Back to School Camp, and it's the preeminent summer camp for teenage unschoolers in the United States. And so teens come from all over the U.S. and Canada to go to a one-week or a two-week session in Oregon or in Vermont, and it happens in August and September during the back-to-school time period. So you know, that's why it's called Not Back to School. And that's where I met all these real life teenagers who did not go to school at all. Because in college, I'd come at it from a very academic perspective, like reading a bunch of books, kind of studying the mythical unschooler, the mythical self-directed learner. And at this camp, I actually met a bunch of them and kind of got to know them and understand their more like practical concerns and realize that they're not supermen and superwomen. They're just kind of like normal teens that are a little bit more independent and idiosyncratic and uh, kind of freedom craving than the, the average teen, a little bit less concerned about social status and hierarchy uh, and image. And so they're really cool teens. And I was also thinking at the same time, like, how can I continue working with these unschooled teens? Because not back to school camp is just a few weeks out of the year. So this is where my company came from. I decided I wanted to try to offer a trip to Argentina for a group of unschooled teenagers. 
And so I put that together and uh, the director of Not Back to School Camp helped me kind of pitch it. And we got nine people to sign up. And all of a sudden I had, you know, a, a business with almost no overhead. And we did the trip and, it, and my budget worked and it was, you know, profitable. It felt wildly profitable to me. I made about $4,000 and I thought it does not get better than this. Uh, and that covered all of my costs for traveling in Argentina for six weeks and the, the plane tickets. And so uh, that was a pretty great equation as far as I'm concerned. And I've continued to do it. Yeah. And when was that first trip? That was fall 2008. Okay. Wow. So how many trips have you done since then? A lot. A lot. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, a lot and also not a lot. It's maybe two trips a year and they might be two international trips. It might be sometimes I've done big domestic trips also in the United States, but it's never more than that because this is a lifestyle business for me. I started this because I want to keep traveling and I want to work with these teens because they're interesting to me. And I feel like I'm kind of uniquely qualified to build rapport with them. And so the, the thought of, of scaling, you know, the mythical word scaling this company and becoming the owner who sits in the office, who you know takes the phone calls from angry parents and does administrative work and payroll is just the last thing on my mind. I've done a lot of trips, but also not as many as these huge trip leading companies where that, you know, it's a business that's providing for lots of different people. This business just provides for me and for my temporary trip co-leaders who I hire to help me run the trips. But otherwise there's, there's no one else in this so-called business. It's just me and my laptop. It seems like you like really focused in on the unschooling crowd, but there's a lot of, I guess, alternative education philosophies, if we want to call them that. What made that one attractive to you? Or why do you believe in that methodology in particular? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And I think it boils down to the accessibility of homeschooling and by corollary unschooling as an option. And I mean, what I mean by that is, for example, here in, in Europe, hanging out with people who are training to be teachers, and when we start talking about alternative schools or alternative education, that means alternative private schools, like a Waldorf school or a Montessori school or a democratic free school, and that means private tuition. And usually these schools are not big enough to offer significant scholarships. And that's the same in the United States with a lot of alternative schools. You know, Just to stay afloat, a school needs to charge something on the order of you know, five to $12,000 a year to just, you know, pay their staff minimally. And a lot of these staff are definitely working for below the wages that they could get working in the public school system or a more traditional private school. And so it, no one's doing this to get rich, but it still ends up costing quite a bit of money to access these alternative methods of education. And here in Germany, homeschooling is illegal. And so you don't have the option of doing anything else. It's either the public school system or you pay money for the private school system. And so that's something that I feel is very unique and very special to the American system. And that also means Canada and the UK and Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. There's some other places that are, that are a lot like us. I mean, we're the, we're the best, honestly. The U.S. is the best at you know, making homeschooling easy and accessible. And it's legal in all 50 states. In some states, there are some regulations where every few years you need to take a standardized test and score like anywhere above the 20th percentile just to prove that you are not like completely incompetent in the general liberal arts. But in other states, California, you know, Texas being the largest states as examples, there are no regulations whatsoever. In California, you sign a single piece of paper called the private school affidavit and you declare your home to be a private school and your child to be attending your private school. And therefore your child is fulfilling the compulsory education laws. And after that, there's nothing. You don't have to take a standardized test. You don't, you know, child protective services is not going to visit you unless somebody, you know, actively complains about you. And so you have this complete blank slate. You have, you know, total freedom to design your educational destiny as you see fit. And that's, that's precious. Like that is special and unique and worth, preserving. And it, and it came out of this weird alliance between evangelical Christians and crunchy, you know, back to the land hippies in the 70s and 80s, back when it was still illegal in those states to homeschool. And so, it, yeah, it's got this weird bipartisanship that I kind of admire too nowadays when everything is so polarized. So unschooling is really like as basic as it gets in terms of alternative education. It's like you sign a piece of paper, you tell your state that you're homeschooling, and then you have a free pass to do whatever you want. You don't have to spend a bunch of money on unschooling. You can spend a bunch of money. You can spend money traveling and sign up for all these extracurricular programs and you know, hiring tutors or whatever. 
Or you can just use the internet a lot. You can rely upon your community and your family, friends, and you know, just reading books. You can just go to the library and read really good books. You can do it for almost no money. And so that's what attracted me to unschooling. I, I feel like it's like the Zen Buddhism of alternative education. It's as pure as it gets. I think the biggest challenge maybe to some of the homeschooling is the social integration. So have you seen, does unschooling do a good job of allowing for social integration for the kids too? How do they get that part of it? Uh, I love this question because it's always the first one that comes up. Something that I like to say is that it's important to be sociable, but not socialized. I think that the, the whole phrase socialization just rubs me the wrong way. It feels very institutional to me. And it, it makes me feel like, you know, the, the question, are they socialized, makes me feel like, have they been sufficiently kind of, have their personalities been ground down and polished so that they will, you know, fit nicely into the institutional structure that, you know, everyone should be prepared for. And I, to that, I'm like, fuck that. <laughs> No, I want to hang out with like weird people, you know, like positively weird, not like, you know, going to stab me weird. And so, yes, we're social creatures. Everyone needs some level of social interaction. And so uh, there is no method of unschooling. So to ask, like, does unschooling provide socialization is kind of a non-question because it's the question is, do parents provide opportunities to young people who unschool seize opportunities? And in my experience, yes, there are unschoolers who are highly social. And it's not a barrier. Okay, it's not easy, but there's also no firm barriers to finding activities where you can have a peer group, where you can be doing stuff with other kids. It doesn't consign you to a life of complete isolation, nor should it. That being said, yes, there are some homeschoolers and unschoolers out there who are like, you know, fairly isolated, but I think it's by choice. And it's a chicken or the egg. It's It's a nurture nature question you know, if you meet a homeschooler who's awkwardly social, is that because they were homeschooled or did they start homeschooling because they are really awkwardly social? And that was their survival mechanism for just not getting torn apart by the wolves in the public school playground. So no, there's no formal barriers to it. Yes, it can be challenging, especially as a teenager when everyone else is in high school or if you're like 18, 19, 20 year old and you're doing a self-directed learning path when everyone else is in college. Yes, you need to try a little bit harder to like find people to be friends with, but it's not impossible. That makes sense. It, the The chicken and the egg problem is a good one. And part of why I like asking that is I had a friend in uh, high school. I went to a boarding high school. And when he got there, that was the first school he had gone to. And he had been homeschooled his whole life, but it had been sort of a strict Catholic parents homeschooling, which I imagine is pretty different from unschooling. And he was very open about how like socially limiting it was and how he had to do work once he did get into that social environment to make himself more social. But it sounds like it's good or it sounds like there's a lot of opportunities for these kids like what you're doing to get it in different ways and honestly, probably better ways where you're going and having fun doing projects and experiences with people instead of competing with them for grades. Yeah. And that's the question that has to be asked when we say, are they socialized? You need to say compared to whom? compared to their same demographic peer group who go to public school. Because in my experience, going to a you know, middle, middle, upper class, you know, relatively well-funded California public school, there was all sorts of very negative socialization that happened on that campus. And you know, lots of bad habits and bad influences just waiting for you right there. And yeah, I don't see it as a very strong argument to be like, well, are you as socialized as the public school kids? Because I'm like, uh, wh- where's the bar here? <laughs> yeah. And so maybe the trade-off that you get with unschooling is a little bit less kind of total socialization hours, but higher quality. And you have more control over your communities, over your peer group. You're spending time with them in voluntary kind of consensual, you know, shared activities instead of being like essentially inmates in the same jail cell. And, uh, I think that that can lead to a much richer level of social interaction and social development. Yeah, that's a good point, especially the element of having to put in effort 
to make friends and be social. I find that so many people when they graduate college in particular have no idea how to make friends outside the prescribed environment of, hey, all these people are in the same place as you. They're all doing the same thing. They're all your age. Like, go make friends. Once you lose that, I think a lot of people right after graduating struggle to figure out how to do that again. And then they end up relying on work for their friendships. And if you graduate and try to do your own thing, it can be really alienating, really lonely for a while until you get that part of your life in check. So in some ways, not having it handed to you on a platter could actually be beneficial for building those skills earlier. Yeah, I completely agree. Do you think the the kids who are able to do this and thrive in the environment are like special in some way? Or do you think that it's an environment that could work for any kid once they get, I guess you'd say, like deacclimated to the institutional model? Uh. No, I don't think they're special. And no, I don't think it can work for every kid. And I think that the entire idea of some educational system working for every kid is hogwash. And we need to do away with that entire meme right now. And I'm just tired of the rebuttal. Oh, that couldn't work for every kid. It's like, no shit. A military school would not work for every kid. A Montessori school would not work for every kid. Big Mick corporate, you know, public school would not work for every kid. That's the point. Education should be a highly diversified, fairly ground up system, not this top down, um, you know, even though it's fairly decentralized in the United States compared to other countries, like it's much more based up on the state and local levels. It's still pretty much one size fits all. And so I think unschooling should be one part, one method, one approach out of many. And that it's not one that you have to stick with and then do for the rest of your educational career. Um, you know, a lot of the kids who I work with, they kind of flow in and out of unschooling. And some of them, you know, were raised traditionally going to school, then they decided not to go to school, then maybe it worked for them, maybe they, it didn't, and they go back into school. Others were raised never going to school at all. But then they realize, ah, there's some things that, you know, are really better done in school. Like if you want to take a a lab science class, like a biology class, when you're 14 or 15 years old, there's not, like if you can get into the community college class, great, but high school might be the place to do it. And there are certain social experiences that if you want to have them, you should probably go to high school. If you want to play team sports, you should probably go to school. And so, you know, I don't see it as something that is so absolute. Uh, There's definitely a level of privilege involved in unschooling, just as there is with any form of alternative education. And I think that there's a good, interesting conversation to be had about why, you know, if you look at an unschooling community, it's mostly like white middle class or middle upper class people. And I think that it's, it's fairly clear to me that immigrant communities or kind of historically marginalized communities are not really going to mess around with alternative education because their main focus is like succeeding in the traditional system, especially for like a recent immigrant family. Like if you are, you know, at the second generation, if you're the, the child of a first generation immigrant from an Eastern Asia, Asian country, for example, like unschooling is not part of the vocabulary. And that, that would never be considered, you know, or excuse me, not never, it would be very difficult to be considered because kind of the whole point of their parents coming over here was to give you, the the child, a chance to succeed in the the American school and especially the American university system. And also, unschooling, I've noticed, is not something that wealthy families really mess around with because, in my experience, they are more concerned with ensuring that their kid can get into an Ivy League school. And that's not something that unschooling or any real form of alternative school can promise And so that's why I think more wealthy kids end up going to prep schools. And so, uh, no, it's not for everyone and nor should it be. It's funny what you mentioned about especially wealthy students avoiding these kinds of alternative education. So that's always been one of my observations with the, I guess, some of the like college problems in particular, too, is that in some ways, the students who end up at the absolute top schools get it the worst where the uh, like the pressure is so much higher to get the highest income possible and the best job possible after you graduate that you end up completely ignoring like all these other opportunities that could be interesting to you and it's weird because you would think that oh you're so privileged right like going to Harvard, Yale, Stanford, whatever but then you get this problem so much worse right of like of all that extra pressure do you think that it would make sense to 
change the existing, both like primary, elementary, middle, high school systems, as well as the typical university system? Or is that system relatively okay for a certain type of student and there just need to be other options? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so yeah, so you're asking that ideally, uh, should it be changed or just should other options be expanded? I think the practical question is a different one. Okay. Yeah. I think that it does work. The public mainstream public school system and private school system, which is a lot like it, um, do work for a lot of students. And I would like to see (laughs) way more alternatives out there. Yeah. That's basically my answer. And I wanted to comment on what you just said about privileged college students. I saw that you've had a conversation with William Duresowitz, who I've been rereading Excellent Sheep recently, and it is so good. It is so, so good. That's a fantastic book. (laughs) Yeah. And the second time is even better. And so he really has his finger on the pulse of that problem. But I think you got it right when you said, like, these are supposed to be the most privileged kids who are going to Harvard and Yale, but you talk to them and they're the most constrained and they feel like they have no other viable path except investment banking and working for McKinsey or Bain or whatever. And yeah, like if the definition of privilege is having, you know, a number of options, a feeling like you can do anything and have security at the same time, like that's not the form of privilege that I want to help instill in kids, you know. And I think these unschoolers have got their fingers on the pulse. And when I say unschoolers, I'm talking about the parents too also, because the parents play a huge role in this process. They have their fingers on the pulse of, I think, a more desirable form of privilege, which is growing up feeling like you can really do anything. And that doesn't mean that, you know, mom and dad are going to break down all the barriers for you, but feeling like they're not going to judge you heavily for not choosing one of a, a very narrowly prescribed set of career paths. And just having this practice of finding resources for yourself and finding paths through these various barriers to higher education, to employment, to, you know, getting interesting volunteering positions or going traveling. I mean, that's the kind of day-to-day work of an unschooler or a self-directed learner is to kind of figure out problems for yourself. And when you're feeling a little bit lost or bored or something like that, to move past that in a way, you know, to figure out a process for yourself to move past that. And that is a true form of privilege right there. That is what will open doors for you any doors, not just the high paid, high status job doors. Yeah, that that self-efficacy is so huge. And like you were saying, there's such a dearth of it, especially at elite institutions where when you've only been trained to do what someone says and get high grades and kind of like jump through hoops, you lose that muscle. And I feel like what you just said with, especially it sounds like unschooling where you have that freedom to explore kind of whatever you're interested in, you have to figure it out and you have to pull the resources to learn how to do it. You build that from a young age, as opposed to the situation that I think a lot of people find themselves in where they want to do something different than, you know, what they decided to gamble on as a freshman in college and they don't have the muscles trained to go after it. Right. Yeah, exactly. They haven't been doing that kind of workout. Were you always comfortable figuring things out? Because it sounds like you had to do that when you made that shift your second year in college. Or did you go through that struggle as well? Uh, My dad has always been an entrepreneur and talked to me about work and career stuff and and work ethic stuff. And I think that's given me a a good foundation. Um, I think getting to go, I, I mentioned that I went to this wilderness summer camp for a number of years as a kid. And also got to live in Chile and have a few other brief travel experiences. I think those were really formative for me. I feel like travel in general, just international travel, I mean, and not tourist package travel, but fairly independent stuff, just is such a great corollary for self-directed learning, for having to kind of figure out, you know, who you are and what you want to do and make it happen. Uh, because nobody's going to hold your hand or make it easy for you. Or if they do, they're going to charge you a bunch of money. <laughs> Actually, that is a perfect analogy. The you know perfect follow the rules, strict student and the 10 day trip where everything is on rails and you never have to speak in the local language or take a local taxi right? versus the unschooling, self-directed learning, self-starting person who just kind of like drops in the country and like uses hand signals to get a taxi somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And Uh, you know, uses couch surfing or something to find somebody they can do language practice with. And, you know, essentially, I I hate the word, but, you know, kind of hustles 
to get the skills and the awarenesses that they need to have a nice time where they're going. Who else do you think does a good job? Because it sounds like you like unschooling, obviously, but have you looked at, you know, Minerva or any other alternative programs that seem like they're moving in a good direction? I actually got the chance to hang out with some Minerva students when I was running my Argentina semester program in uh, the first few months of 2017. Oh, that's right, because they do a semester there. Yeah, and so I got to hang out with one of their first cohorts. I'm not sure it was the first or second, and talked to a number of students, and I gave a talk on education that some Minerva people attended. And I think it's a very interesting model. After talking to students there, I don't feel that it's highly alternative in the sense of I don't know. It's alternative in like the Silicon Valley sense of alternative, like integrating really cool tech stuff. The fact that, you know, you're going to all these different capital cities and all your courses are online and everything is tracked down to the you know iota. Yeah, I think that's interesting, but that's not what really captures me. Like fundamentally, their mission is to become the next Ivy League school. And if you're going to do that, then you are going to compete with Harvard and Yale and you're going to do what, what all the other Ivy Leagues do. And so it's still like fairly intense academics. And that's fine, you know, if you're looking for that experience. But no, that's not kind of where my interests lie. So a lot of families are interested in unschooling, but there's the very practical issue that, you know, both parents are working, or maybe there's only one parent, especially for having younger kids. It's practically impossible to do that if nobody can be at home with them. And so I started out interested in democratic free schools and specifically the Sudbury Valley School, which is in Massachusetts. And it was started in 1968 when there was this flurry of activity in the whole world of alternative education. And that's when all these free schools, and by free, that doesn't mean financially free. They're private schools and they charge money. But free meaning you're free to choose whatever you want to do. There's no formal requirements about what you do. There's you know, there might be classes offered, there might be activities going on, and you can do all of it or none of it. And so I think that free schools, democratic free schools, like the Sudbury Valley School, um, they have a whole kind of network of schools out there in the US and across the world are very interesting. I think that um, there's a, a model called Liberated Learners, which is based upon another center in Massachusetts called North Star, which is has been the number one place where I, I point people when they're looking for like a brick and mortar version of unschooling. I say, go look at North Star. And North Star, their subtitle is self-directed learning for teens. And so it's only for teens. And they're very adamant about not calling themselves a school. And in fact, they don't even stay open five days a week. They close on Wednesdays just to like kind of drill it into your head that they're not a school. It's like, what school closes on Wednesdays? None. Exactly. We're not a school. And so, but they're a lot like a democratic free school. They've got all sorts of activities. They've got a, you know, a, a big building, lots of books, computer stuff, music rooms, and it's only for teenagers. And so, you know, a bunch of 13 to 17 year olds and there's staff there and they will help you with anything you want, but fundamentally they will leave you alone, you know, unless you are actively you know, breaking things or harassing other teenagers there, you know, they do have you know, it's not Lord of the Flies. They have some community norms. And so this is an environment where you can find other teenagers, because I think it's easy to point to homeschooling and unschooling as an easy option for elementary school age kids and younger, because that's when kids are more parent focused. They're more like, I want to learn how the world works. And, you know, as soon as adolescence hits, then they're like, I don't care how the world works. I want to learn how other people work. Like, I want to learn from my peer group. I'm much less interested in adult knowledge now. Um, they're still interested. It's just not the number one priority. And so that, that's why a place like a North Star is very important because it's a place just for teens. They can come. They can hang out. They can have options. They can see, like, ah, oh, these other kids who I like are going to this math class or they're going to do this, uh, this drama production. Maybe I can join. And I think that's what a lot of people associate with the benefit of high school which is you get out there and you, you kind of learn what you don't yet know about the world. You get exposed to things and you have, you know, maybe you get kind of swept into social opportunities and that's very valuable. And if you are just sitting at home on your computer as an unschooler, just learning from your computer, I think you are genuinely missing out on some opportunities. And so I'm a big fan of the North Star model. And there's some other ones out there, but those are the first places that I go are the, the democratic free schools and the, the North Star liberated learners model centers. Very cool. Have you ever thought about starting your own either elementary level school or inst 
I, I don't, I don't want to call it a school now, but something like North center. Star. Yeah, use the center. word center. center. That, that's, okay. that's pretty harmless. Yeah. I don't want to say institution either. That's oh god, <laughs> that no, even that's worse. terrible. Yeah, and then I would be institutionalizing. <laughs> but have you ever thought of starting something like North Star yourself? Yeah, I I keep a goal list, a life goal list on my website, and one of the ones that's been on there the longest is start a school, and I kind of clarify it by saying like, a long term structured learning program. And a few years ago, I got very interested in the possibility of starting a sort of boarding school for unschoolers because there's not many of them out there. There's Summerhill in England, which was started in the 20s and has long been a very inspiring model for people who like democratic free schools, uh, even though I believe it's publicly funded now. But nothing like that. There, there's a lot of day centers for that support self-directed learning, but overnight ones like you can look at the Arthur Morgan School up in, in Western North Carolina, which is more Montessori based, it's more middle school. They do some cool things where you live with in a small house with a house parent. And there's a lot of work involved, you're working on a farm, the kids are doing the cooking for the whole school. There are academic classes, but they're on broad themes. And the amount of time dedicated to academics versus all this other more practical stuff is much more healthfully balanced, in my opinion. And so there are some cool things out there. And I spent some time seriously looking into it. And it's hard. It's just very hard to get. It costs a lot of money to get a site like that, like millions and millions of dollars. And it's just not the right moment in my life for that. But it's something I definitely might come back to. And right now I'm still running these international trips, a couple of them a year. And I'm thinking more seriously about building something online and something that works more directly with parents because I've spent a lot of time working directly with teens and I feel like that's valuable and teens need people. Adults who are not their family members who will advocate for them, who will kind of speak directly to them instead of having to go through their parents. But parents are important and valuable and they are really the drivers of these of the unschooling process in my practical experience. Like I, ideally I want to imagine this 16 year old who discovers unschooling and goes and advocates to her parents to, you know, drop out of school and is highly self-motivated from the get-go. But really what's happening, that's really the exception to the rule. The rule is mom discovers unschooling and sees that, you know, her kid is suffering through the school experience or discovers it when the kid is in utero and never sends the kid to school. And it's, sometimes it's dad, but it's overwhelmingly it's mom who discovers it. And then I'm trying to uh, come to terms with that fact. And I'm in a big research phase for uh, I'm reading parenting books right now and uh, trying to get my bearings in this new world. And it is what you might want to do for parents, because it sounds like it could be a really interesting opportunity. Like I, I haven't thought about this before, but I think you're entirely right that you almost have to fix part of the education problem at the parent level and reframing how they think about how their kids should learn instead of just trying to motivate kids to push their parents in a different direction. Yeah, it's hard to do that as a kid. You have very limited power. And yeah, maybe an online course, but it's kind of like the word hustle. It's like the phrase online course just kind of makes my skin crawl. And I've never taken an online course or I've, maybe I have and I got really bored and, and quickly you know, forgot about it. And so I, that's what I'm struggling with right now. Like what to build that's actually useful that people would be busting down the doors to get because I don't want to spend a bunch of time building something that nobody cares about or is really boring, uh, which I think is the majority of online courses out there. And unfortunately, you haven't really brought up MOOCs yet, but that's definitely the big problem with MOOCs is just how few people pay attention to them or, or complete them. Yeah, the, the 5% completion rate, and that might be optimistic. And that's and it's mostly the foreign students who are achieving that and the ones who already have bachelor's degrees. Like it's not this mythical, you know, army of dropouts and self-educators, you know, at least really young ones who don't already have formal education under their belt. Yeah, I'm completely with you on MOOCs. It's a shit show. <laughs> well, and that actually reminds me of what we were talking about earlier, which is the whole self-starting, self-motivating for somebody who's been in the system for a while. And you were starting to go into how you kind of got used to doing that. Do you remember what you're going to say? Because we're talking about your dad being entrepreneurial. Yes, that's right. That's where we got derailed. Yes. So I think having a parent who is very entrepreneurial helped. I think having two parents who would unconditionally support my choices definitely helps. And talk about privilege. That's the ultimate privilege right there, right? Like supportive parents who aren't questioning your every move. And if you decide to 
you know, it's take one step away from the traditional academic success pathway, then you get berated. And so when I thought, you know, maybe I won't do, I won't get a degree in astrophysics from Berkeley, which is, you know, pretty high on the uh, traditionally impressive spectrum right there. And instead, I'm going to major in hippie arts, essentially, with a self-designed degree. Like They were like, great. You know, this sounds like something you're really passionate about. Yeah, I think that must be mentioned. Uh, but yes, I did have to do some kind of decompressing. And I remember when I first got into all this stuff, I came up with this idea for an alternative school. And I thought, oh, man, this would be so crazy. This would be so out there. And it was a school that would be a The shape of the building would be a hexagram. And then from each of the different vertices, they would go straight into the middle. And so you'd have six triangles that make up this building. And within each of those triangles would be a room for a different academic discipline, like the history room, the English room, the foreign language room. But there would be open doors in between them. And kids would be free to just go into different rooms and to do whatever they, you know, kind of dabble and and pick and choose. And I thought... for some reason, that skateboarding should be integrated into all this. I don't know. But like that was my idea of a radical alternative school. And I think that that's, I have to constantly remind myself, like, that's where I started. That's where a lot of people start when they start questioning the system, which is not even thinking out of the box of that the only worthwhile things to learn are academic things. Um, so yes, I had to go through some of that. But it was a pretty quick transition for me. I definitely bought into it. And I recognized that self-directed learning was something that I had already been practicing. Like all of my best memories of high school assignments were the ones where you got to be self-directed. Like I remember uh, doing a graphic design elective course in high school. And I got to just fiddle around in Photoshop for a number of months and create something. It was just like create some project in Photoshop. And so I created this giant snowboarding montage and it was great. Like I learned so much Photoshop and I've been using those skills ever since. Or, you know, getting to choose your topic for an essay in English, you know, essentially having a big research paper. I embraced that. And so, yeah, I I was primed a little bit for this. A a lot of kids have to go through a de-schooling process. And this is kind of jargon in the unschooling community. And the, the rule of thumb is that for every year that you spent in school, you probably need a month to de-school right after you leave. And so if you went through six years of school and then in seventh grade you dropped out, this kid probably needs six months of de-schooling, which means being allowed and being supported in the act of doing nothing that seems productive or official or like it's learning. And so like parents freak out during this time period because they see, they read all this stuff about unschooling and self-directed learning and hear the stories of the kids who are out there you know, doing incredible things. And then they're they're like, all right, well, my kid hates seventh grade. I'm going to, you know, support them in dropping out. And then the kid just goes home and watches YouTube videos all day. And they're like, what is going on? This is not the, this is not what I signed up for. And the kid's just like, this is all I want to do. Please leave me alone. You know? And so this is a crucial period. I I feel like I I went through this in, in some small way in college, but not to the extent of like wanting to do nothing for six months which I now see as a very important and valid period of time to decompress from the, the expectations and the, the pace of traditional education. It's also probably motivating for anybody listening who feels like they're just now getting out of that mindset, whether they're like leaving a job or considering leaving a job or finishing college and want to do their own thing, that drive to just chill for a couple of months is <laughs> totally normal. <laughs> Just relax. Yeah, kind of like decompress. That's probably part of why it's hard to go straight from doing a job and like doing a job you don't like to doing your own thing or going straight from college to doing your own thing, right? Like you probably needed some of the time in South America to help you decompress in a bit too, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Especially because I went straight from college into full-time work without significant breaks. And I did that for two years. And then I quit and I did not go seek another job. I said, I need time to figure out what's going on because I'm not seeing any clear path forward for myself here if I'm going to kind of stay true to my values. So yeah, that was definitely a decompression period for me where I had nobody breathing down my neck, nobody telling me what I could or could not do, no expectations, just me and some long distance buses in South America. Yeah, well, hopefully everybody listening gets that opportunity at some point. I feel like we could go on for at least another hour. This has been a really fun conversation. Are there any last thoughts that we haven't touched on that you want to throw out there? 
Yeah. Well, just when I heard myself saying like, yeah, let a kid do nothing for six months, you know, if they drop out in seventh grade, yeah, I just realized that that's, that's another kind of reflection of, of this basic level of privilege. And I'm talking mostly about like financial privilege that was kind of assumed in this world. And a really hard part of it, and I'm talking from the perspective of a, a parent who's supporting their kid in leaving school for a moment, a really hard part of it is being is navigating the social environment of other adults and other parents and saying that I let my seventh grader drop out of school and now they're watching YouTube videos and staying up till 4 a.m. each night. Like, I think that's that must be really hard. I mean, I know it's hard. I've heard this because, you know, better or worse, parents feel like the educational success of their kids is a reflection of their, their parenting abilities, even if that's not true at all. And so I imagine that it's, you know, that's the situation for, I know it's a situation for teenagers who drop out who think about other teenagers and the fact that it's Tuesday at 10 a.m. and other teenagers are currently doing work, you know, regardless of how shitty the work is, they're doing something. And I, you know, have just woken up at 10 a.m. on Tuesday and I am now going to eat some cereal and watch YouTube videos. Or even if you've gotten through that de-schooling phase and you're like, okay, I'm going to go like work on my music project right now. And you love music and you're learning songs on a guitar maybe, but it doesn't feel like it's real capital R work. And same thing goes for college age students who have decided not to go straight into college or not to go to college at all or to leave school early. And uh, yeah, just kind of comparing yourself to this other, to this giant age cohort and saying, God, am I a screw up? Am I a failure for not doing what all these other kids are doing? Like that seems like whatever gene it is or whatever personality trait it might be that allows you to essentially ignore that voice saying everyone else is doing this thing. Why am I not doing this too? Like that must be some kind of precondition for success with self-directed learning. That that, and also having the, the option to just like sit around home for six months You know, if you drop out in seventh grade or if you go back home after, you know, leaving college at age 19 and just, you know, sit at home for six months and try to figure out the next thing or go travel internationally. That takes money. Definitely. (laughs) Uh, And where can people find you online or what do you want to check out if they're interested in learning more about all this? The best place to go is BlakeBowles.com and that's B-L-A-K-E-B-O-L-E-S.com. And I've got links to all my writing, all the podcasting stuff and the live speaking stuff that I do. And you can get actually, since I think your audience is more on the side of college age people who are not going to school anymore, you can get this is kind of a secret, you can get a free copy of my book better than college by signing up for my author mailing list. And then you also get a nice email once a month with my favorite education related links. Boom, win win. Perfect. (laughs) I'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. Everybody can find that. And yeah, I'm really glad that we got to connect. And uh, you said you're going to be in New York end of December? Yeah, actually go to blakebowls.com slash now and you can see where I am and where I'm going to be. But I'm all over the place that and and I don't have a permanent home base. And I actually wrote about that last year. At, I have a different website called howtolivenowhere.com which is a a free online book about living nomadically in your 20s. Yeah, well, if you do end up making it to New York end of December, uh, let me know. I'll be around. Sounds good. Hope to see you then. Yeah, have a good one, Blake. Take care now. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Nat Chat. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to Nat Chat in iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Second, If you're trying to take advantage of some of the information from this episode, be sure you check out the show notes at nataliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N dot com slash podcast and find a friend because implementing a lot of this stuff is much easier if you have somebody to do it with. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode and you've been enjoying other episodes of the podcast, please leave it a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your casts so that more people can find it. This is the best way for it to get some more exposure and to make sure that I can keep bringing these episodes to you. With that, thank you and have an awesome rest of your day.